Hello, everybody. So we are bringing you Block Digest number 176 at block height 576,178 on Wednesday, May 15th. What is up? Yeah, it is the middle of May, man, and you can tell. It's starting to warm up, feel a little like summer. Got out for the bike ride and climbing the mountains, all that stuff. But, yeah, it seems like everything's lively in Bitcoin, too. Everybody was talking about Magical Crypto Conference and, I guess, Consensus Live is going on. So, uh, a lot of stuff going on. So, uh, how are you doing this morning, Janine? Yep, a lot of stuff going on this month in general. Same, same here. Um, I'm good, but pretty overwhelmed, actually. How about you, Nick? Doing good, but yeah, I mean, it seems like the uh, meetup, I've seen like about 10 members joined in the past week. Everybody's starting to get a little bit more bullish, it looks like. That's definitely it's a, it's a bubba. It's a bubba. <clears throat> You, you, you're, Bubba, it's coming. <laughs> you're you're welcome for the bull sacrifice at, at the magical crypto conference, everybody. You you you're welcome. That must have been what happened. It was a bull sacrifice to start the bull market, eh? Mm -hmm. but yeah, that that was a freaking exhausting weekend. Yeah, man. So tell us about it. Like, uh, did you get to? Meet some enemies and friends alike. Tell us about your yarn beard. Um, well, you can discover uh, about my yarn beard on Twitter if you definitely dig around. But I disguised my face. Uh, got to meet a lot of people I've known for a while. Uh, meet some new people. And uh, tell some people uh, in person instead of on the internet how stupid I think they are and why I think they're stupid. So, uh, yeah, it was a... Pretty entertaining weekend, aside from all the running around and working. <laughs> Is there anyone that you told you appreciated and admired? Um, <laughs> no. Wow. Yeah, man. Uh, it sounds like, uh, yeah, it must have been some interesting discussions. I'd have liked to have been a fly on the wall. But, uh, yeah, it seems like that's going to be the go-to conference, man. Yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, the, the shitcoin nonsense was an absolute minimum, which was pretty enjoyable. And, uh, and yes, I, I did bust Charlie's balls multiple times, reminding him that Light, Litecoin is a scam. So, so that, that was pretty funny. Chicken. <laughs> and what about our favorite uh, podcaster slash self-acclaimed journalist? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I many times um, told him I think he's an idiot and then had a chance on Sunday to explain in long form uh, why. Pretty pretty much repeating everything I've already said on Twitter. Uh, How did you like him in real life? He's, he's the same person. I think he, he is just uh, clueless, uh, unwilling to accept the responsibility that comes with providing informational content in the space. And I hope that one day he, he realizes that and stops being uh, such an idiot. Uh, it's hard work, man. But yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of eyes on him. So, you know, I imagine, I mean, he's been trying to write everything. But yeah, so uh, speaking of serious stuff going on in space, should we start to break into what's going on in the news? Yeah, you want to take it away, Jenny? 
Well, before I begin that, um, first of all, if there are any Americazis out there, Americazis is the word that we use to describe Americans. Um, if any of you are, if you ever happen to be living or traveling in Austria and you lose your passport or for some reason you cannot figure out where to locate the U.S. Embassy, uh, you can now seek uh, the, the yellow arches of misery burgers and they will have a hotline to contact consular services in Austria. You should note, though, that McDonald's will not be issuing visas or new passports themselves, obviously. And no, this is not a joke. This was actually reported yesterday in the ARD uh, Südost Europa, and it was retweeted by the U.S. Embassy in Vienna account. So it is a thing. You can now contact the U.S. Embassy through the Golden Arches. Why can't I get a, a passport for McDonald's? I want a, a McDonald's passport. They're called McPasses or McVisas. <laughs> On a more serious note, though, um, I'm still closely following the extradition proceedings against Julian Assange, which I probably will be doing at least for the next month and a half, if not longer, because that's when the actual hearings that have any substance will start. Um, and also the wider situation involving Chelsea Manning and with the grand jury in the U.S., as well as the arrest and detention of a software developer named um, Ola Bini in Quito on pretty baseless allegations that he was orchestrating some kind of plot to take down the Ecuadorian government on behalf of WikiLeaks. Um, pretty bizarre. And so there's a few key updates. Um, you can see both of these. I've so far written two blog posts. Um, I've kind of tried to separate them because the first one was getting rather long, but uh, most of this is from the second one. So the probably the most interesting thing is that the, uh, I believe I've said on the show before that the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press has been trying to get as many of the documents related to the WikiLeaks grand jury and Assange extradition released to the public. And on April 26th, the Alexandria division replied to say that the arrest warrant, which uh, the RCFP was seeking to have to be made public, uh, has not been executed yet. Now that may confuse people because this basically indicates that, you know, the the obviously the Metropolitan Police in London cited an arrest warrant and an extradition request from the United States. So obviously a arrest warrant or extradition request has been executed. Um, but they apparently claim in this response that there are actually two arrest warrants and one of them remains unexecuted and we don't yet know the contents. Um, and this fits with our suspicion that the Department of Justice plans to bring more charges um, that are even more extensive than the one they've given um, as justification for the extradition from the UK, uh, which was very light um, in terms of what they were charging him with. And that just, it, there's no possible way that he's going to get five years in prison with all the time and resources they've spent trying to get him. So. Uh, we'll get into why that part is important uh, later, but um, as I believe I pointed out in the first live stream that we did about um, Assange's arrest in episode 171.5, um, the day that he was arrested, his lawyer, uh, Jennifer Robinson, and the acting editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks held a press conference uh, to disclose that an investigation into an alleged transnational extortion scheme against WikiLeaks, uh, specifically around Assange being in the embassy, uh, had been going on involving people in Ecuador, Spain, and the UK. Um, and if lately, like the last month or so, you've seen some rather rough footage of Assange uh, rolling a skateboard around in a sitting room or throwing a toy to his pet cat, God forbid, uh, those are examples of footage that was collected as part of a surveillance operation on the Ecuadorian embassy in London, which they were doing themselves at least for the last uh, one and a half years or so via a company called Prom Security, um, which was selected after, there was actually a different company that was handling security and surveillance on the embassy prior to Lennon Moreno, and then that company was switched out for a new one. Um, and it's yet to be determined how exactly the, the surveillance footage from Prom Security came into the hands of extortionists, but, um, 
some of the recent discoveries in the investigation of that extortion scheme um, are in the first blog post. And so it was reported on May 3rd that a man named um, Jose Martin Santos, who also goes by the name Pepe or Pepe Marti, has been arrested in connection with the extortion scheme. And I haven't checked the news um, recently on this case in the last day or so to see if there's been more developments. But according to the reports in Spanish media, there's been as many as four individuals um, in addition to Pepe uh, arrested as well. Um, though I haven't seen it reported whether any staff from, you know, prom security or the Ecuadorian embassy have been questioned. They'll probably be a bit more difficult to get a hold of. Um, interestingly, uh, Pepe and at least one other individual were arrested in Alicante, which is a city on, on the coast of Spain. And it was revealed in the INA papers, which is part of a whole um, corruption investigation into the president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, that Moreno uh, purchased a luxury apartment uh, significantly below market value in that city through a friend, um, a Spanish citizen named Emilio Torres Cap uh, Capado. And um, that guy has since made his Twitter account private. So it's just interesting that he, one of those apartments that was part of the Inna Papers, um, which by the way, just a reminder, was not published by WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks only shared links to reporting on that. They were not behind that release. Um, so it's just interesting that that, that occurred in the same city. Uh, the third point is that on May 6, uh, Chelsea Manning filed a declaration in response to the grand jury subpoena to say that she believed the US prosecution wanted to, um, the reason she was being held is because they wanted to, quote, uh, undermine my potential testimony as a defense witness. And um, it was a really sad response as well, because she detailed all of the psychological and physiological injuries that she has incurred as a result of not being treated adequately while she's been detained and uh, in being in solitary confinement. And she remains adamant in her decision to not cooperate with the grand jury investigation. Um, she said at the end, I can either go to jail or betray my principles. The latter exists as a much worse prison the government can construct. Um, then uh, the day, a day later on May 7th, uh, lawyer Tor Eklund, who was actually the U.S. counsel for Lori Love, when he was similarly fighting against extradition to the United States, um, he wrote that the soundness of the indictment against Assange according to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which I haven't checked if they, do, if they directly cite that in the indictment, but a lot of the charges are very similar to charges that are made based on the CFAA. And so he says that under the CFAA, it's actually not against the law to crack a password. You have to crack a password and then use it to gain unauthorized access to a system gaining, attempting to gain, or conspiring to gain access is the critical element. So it, it would depend on whether he actually used the password um, or whether they have enough evidence that he was conspiring to gain access to additional documents. Now, from the evidence we've known about since this whole thing began way back in um, 2010 and 11, um, the Obama administration had already decided not to prosecute on this basis because they, uh, as it shows in the indictment, they don't actually have evidence that Assange successfully cracked the password um, or that if he had successfully cracked the password, he would have gained access to any additional documents um, that Manning had not already provided him. Uh, and why is that important? Well, the reason they suspect that he may have wanted to crack the password was so that Manning could obscure her identity uh, to maybe give herself some degree of protection if they came in trying to investigate her as the whistleblower behind the disclosures. So at best, the password was not really going to give her access to anything else or give him access to anything. Uh, it would have just been another account and it would have obscured the identity. So basically that was just a legal analysis. And so far, neither the uh, DOJ indictment nor the FBI affidavit, which was submitted to support the arrest warrant um, has declared that they have evidence that Assange successfully cracked the password. Um, and so then on May 9th, Manning was actually released from the 
um, Alexandria Detention Center due to the expiration of the EDVA grand jury. Now, everyone was very happy about this. The problem is, um, as we should have su suspected from the fact that there is supposedly a second arrest warrant for Assange, is that there is now a second grand jury, and she has been requested to um, give testimony in that now. And if she refuses, she will basically be detained again uh, tomorrow because that would that's when she's supposedly required to appear for that and you know decide whether she wants to testify. Obviously, she's going to refuse um, based on all of her prior statements. So basically, she got one week out of prison and then she's going back. Um, another thing that happened is that on May 13th, the Swedish Deputy Director of Public prosecution announced that they had reopened the preliminary investigation that they had previously discontinued in 2017 um, into the remaining allegation against Assange in Sweden. And since the title of today's episode is Does Anyone Actually Read? Um, I think it is. I actually didn't check, but I hope it is. Mm -hmm. I will point out um, it's not. No, Damn it. Well, I put it in a sub as a submission. So I, so I myself did not read the title of this episode. There you go. Uh, anyway, I will point out once again that Sweden has not charged Assange. There are no charges. There have never been any charges in Sweden whatsoever. No charges. There still are no charges. There is not an indictment either. Um, this whole announcement was just them saying that they have reopened a preliminary investigation and he will be interviewed again for the third time, by the way. He's been interviewed now three times. He was interviewed when he was first accused, not charged, when he was first accused, when he was still in Sweden. He was then given permission to leave Sweden by the prosecutor. And then she decided to um, initiate, you know, an arrest warrant, blah, 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 Interpol red notice later on after he had already left. Then it took them, let's see, that was in 2010, and then they didn't interview him until I think the beginning of 2016, or no, late 2016, sometime in 2016. And then they decided in May 2017 to close that preliminary investigation. So they have now interviewed him three times. They want to, um, or they've now interviewed him twice. They want to interview him a third time. And, oh, look, despite their seven years of whining that they couldn't come to London to interview him, they now say that because of, quote, new laws, uh, they are able to interview him via video link. Of course, there are no new laws required to do that because they were interviewing other, at least 40 other people in the period, I think, between November 2010 and sometime in 2015. They interviewed over 40 people who were not extradited back to Sweden in order to conduct that interview. They interviewed them right in the UK. And these were people that were accused of murder um, and fraud. And so it like, and the, they issued an Interpol red notice, which is usually reserved for murder, rape, serious fraud, et cetera. Uh, so it would have been perfectly in line with procedure for them to come to London and interview him. They refused to do so. Uh, at the advice of the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK. So if anyone is at fault here, it is the authorities in London. And so now they're saying, oh yes, we can interview him by video link. Well, that's great. You should have done that maybe seven years ago. Um, and so these are the points that I think are important developments. Um, obviously I'm spending a large amount of time talking about this because this is mostly what I'm focusing on. Um, but basically, the, the next big day in the terms of the timeline is May 30th, because that is the second, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, it's like a, it's a process hearing where not, the, it's not really a hearing where an actual trial or anything will begin. Like, the, the U.S. government basically just has to prove that or show enough evidence that there is cause for an extradition hearing. And then the extradition hearing, if cause is found um, and the U.K. accepts that, that will start on June 12th. Um, so I'm going to be following all of that in my second blog post. Well, I really appreciate the updates here because, yeah, this is an incredible Thing that we're all witnessing i mean this is a culmination of years and years of this fight for what's right and i mean uh you know julian assange has been locked up in ecuadorian embassy for seven years and chelsea manning was locked up in solitary confinement and 
you know, last year or it was the uh, 2017 or 2018. Uh, she got the pardon by Obama and now she has to go back for 63 days this year. And going back to this trial again, for the second grand jury, it's obvious that she's just a pawn in this bigger fight for Assange and his prosecution is, yeah, his arrest and whatever the sentence and prosecution is. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a public execution of, a right to hold your government accountable. I mean, because it's ultimately what happened. I mean, we could talk about cracked passwords and obfuscation to try and conceal a whistleblow, you know, but uh, ultimately it was a report on war crimes, which is a right to a free press to report on the government. And I mean, it was damaging to the empire and what they were trying to achieve. And that was, that's, this is what we're in the fight for is like they're saying, well, it's worth it because we need to show everyone that this is what happens. Yeah. And I just want to point out, like, in addition to um, Assange's right as a publisher, as a journalist to communicate with the source and even as many journalists do encourage them to get more documentation to provide further context for whatever they have already provided it was Chelsea Manning's responsibility, according to the Army's code of conduct, to disclose and expose, you know, war crimes. If there is any criminal activity going on that is against international law, against U.S. law, any of that, she was responsible. Like, that was her duty to expose that, according to the Army's own code of conduct. So she followed their rules. Of course, they don't like it because the amount of crime that she exposed was huge and they don't want to hold themselves accountable for that. So she followed the rules. They didn't. They left her no avenue to follow the rules in a way that wouldn't permanently you know, destroy her life uh, in so many ways. Um, but yeah, I, like I think that gets lost a lot of the time because we talk about, you know, Assange's right to do this, but then very few people remember that Chelsea Manning also had a responsibility, uh, even as an army officer to also do something. Yeah, I could speak to that for a second. It's just like, uh, you know, we all kind of swore in with that. You, you know, you're supposed to protect the nation from enemies, foreign and domestic and, you know, these are one of those uh, things where you run into whenever you're serving. I mean, there's a reason there's a low remittance rate. It doesn't just have to do with soldiers get beat up and get out. I mean, some of it's got a lot to do with uh, getting in there and, you know, seeing what you're, uh, what you're fighting with and what you're up against if you try to take that route. And uh, it's scary. So, yeah, um, you know, all the credit to her and Assange for trying to fight this, uh, you know, this monstrosity against uh, freedom and liberty. But yeah, we're getting uh, getting logged up on time here. So uh, you want to take us into uh, what's going on next, Shinobi? I know you got to break us down a lot more with uh, Finson. Let's uh, let's tear into it. Yeah, you, you don't have anything else on uh, Assange or Manning before we move along, Janine? Nope, this will probably be my, unless anything major happens, this is going to be my last main update on the show until probably May 30th. Alrighty then. <clears throat> so let's dive into the FinCEN guidance. Um, well, uh, there's a lot of stuff to get through, and I'm mainly just going to be uh, keeping two main points here. So I guess to start off, um, can can you can you start with what is the significance of this? Th this is pretty much um, FinCEN clarifying what does or does not constitute a money service business under current laws and regulations. So this this in no way is any kind of new law, new regulation. This is just FinCEN clarifying how current laws and regulations apply to things in the cryptocurrency space. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to start off around page nine. Um, everything before this is mostly just definitions, clarifications. Um, if, if you really want to get that much uh, groundwork, uh, you can go back and read the links in the show notes. But I'm going to start off with the exemptions. 
So in which cases are you explicitly not considered a money service business? The first is providing delivery, communication, or network access services used by a money transmitter. So if you're doing anything that is facilitating a money service business or money transmission, but you are not directly involved with it, like you're just operating a messaging system, a, a network service for them to access, you are not a money service business. Anybody acting as a payment processor to facilitate the purchase of, payment of a bill for, a good or service through a clearance or settlement system by agreement with a creditor or seller is not a money service business. Anybody who operates a clearance or settlement system that is solely um, organized between BSA regulated institutions is not a money service business. Anybody who physically transports currency, other monetary instruments, commercial paper, or value substitutes, so things like an armored car or a courier that is literally doing nothing but holding custody of something to transport from one place to another is not a money service business. Anybody who provides prepaid access to something is not a money service business. And anybody who accepts or transmit funds that they have to transmit for the purposes of selling other goods or services that are not at their core money transmission services is not a money service business. So if you have some kind of business model that is doing something besides moving money around, but cannot function as a business model without you transmitting funds to facilitate that other service or good being sold, then you are not a money service business. So these are really the core um, exemptions here. If you can fall into this um, anywhere that there are not other clarifications or exceptions to that, then you are exempt um, from being regulated as a money service business. Now, um, to move on, anything that is qualified as a money service business has strict AML procedures that you have to follow. So mostly this is going to involve obviously record keeping um, and, and transmission of, of identifying records in the process of um, transmitting a payment. Although there is not a requirement to transmit that information through the same channel as a payment. So you are able to say use one communication mechanism to actually move the money and a separate one to pass along any identifying information with that payment. As well, the, the, the core of the AML stuff is mostly risk management and risk assessment. So the big requirement there is kind of scoping and analyzing your customer base um, based on where you're operating, like which jurisdictions, which communities, and coming up with a risk assessment to how exposed you are to the risk of being used for things like money laundering, terrorist financing, or financial crime based on the composition of your customer base and the geogra or geographic areas in which you are providing your, your services or product. So there, if, if, if for any reason you fall under uh, money service business regulation, that is an absolute requirement that there is no way to get out of whatsoever. So next up, um, this one is pretty much just confirming something that's already been widely known and widely seen in the space and giving a little bit of a clarity to it, which is um, being a peer-to-peer -peer exchanger. So somebody who is buying or selling cryptocurrencies through platforms like local Bitcoins, any kind of cash in hand thing and this would apply to something like bisque as well not not the company or the the product or platform bisque but to anybody actively trading on it 
if you are on in a regular basis buying and selling cryptocurrency through a platform like this regardless of whether you are just a person doing this have a registered business etc you are a money service business so you have to register you have to follow AML procedures you have to KYC the people that you are dealing with and keep records of this like this this has been put here crystal clear at this point and there is also exemptions for people not doing this frequently and not doing this as a, a means to profit or gain and that that's the way i interpret this armchair lawyering a bit here is they're they're not saying that you can't profit or gain from a single sale like if you were to sell some of your bitcoins at a profit but that you cannot be regularly engaging in trading back and forth for the means of a profit so pretty much what this would mean is let's say you are just a person who owns bitcoin you go to a platform like bisque or local bitcoins just to sell it just to remove some of your risk or exit part of your bitcoin position you are not a money service business you are exempt from any kind of regulation in that area but if you are a person who is regularly buying and selling on platforms like that like going to an exchange purchasing coins selling them for a premium on local bitcoins or bisque or vice versa you are a money service business you are required to register as one within 180 days of beginning that activity comply with aml regulations record keepings and reporting requirements such as suspicious activity reports now the next topic covered here is wallets and one of the core distinctions they draw here kind of splitting things in two is hosted wallets and unhosted wallets and really there, there's four different points here that they use to try to decide whether or not a wallet constitutes something that would be considered a money service business who owns the value so who, who is who is legally the owner of whatever is being stored where is the value actually stored and whether the owner directly interacts with the payment system which would in this case be like the bitcoin network are you directly interacting with the bitcoin network or are you interacting with a hosted service that then interacts with the bitcoin network for you and lastly whether the person who is an intermediary in any kind of interaction with the bitcoin network has total independent control over the value so whether or not that intermediary is capable of actually spending, moving, or controlling those funds completely without any input from the user. Now, anything that falls into a hosted wallet provider that meets all of these criteria, um, so effectively the value is stored with the hosted wallet provider, the wallet provider and not the user is the one interacting with the Bitcoin network and the wallet provider has the ability to pretty much do whatever they want with those funds without the user being able to stop them. That is a money service business. So things like Coinbase, their wallet that allows transacting, that is a money service business. Things like Blue Wallet, when you are using it custodially, tipping me these things are money service businesses so that is being explicitly clarified here pretty much anything that is purely custodial where the user does not have the ability to unilaterally move their funds wherever they want without any kind of permission from the custodian is a money service business black and white like that is the state of things there is no more gray area there is no more attempting to play games or skirt around things if you fall into that category you are a money service business now as far as any kind of wallet software where the user has complete independent control they are directly interacting with the bitcoin network themselves 
not a money service business. So any kind of wallet, Wasabi, Samurai, Electrum, Bitcoin Core, complete crystal clarity, these are not money service businesses. Now a small subsection in this area specifically deals with the issue of multi-signature wallet providers. So anything that, uh, like, you know, uh, the green address or lightning network wallets are the, the two things I think that are most clearly in this category. The value belongs to the user. The, they are interacting directly with the Bitcoin network. Um, the, the only thing really here that uh, another participant in the multi-sig has any control over is whether or not to sign a multi-sig but this does not, or a multi-sig transaction, but this does not give them unilateral control over the fund. And if you remember that last qualification here for something to be considered a money service business is if some other third party entity or intermediary has unilateral control over funds. Now the example used in this passage is just a two of two multi-signature wallet. So this is something where both parties are required to sign together to actually make a movement of funds. It is not a two of three where the user has the ability to move funds without any input from the other party. So I want to be crystal clear here. If I have a multi-sig wallet where you have to sign in order to move funds, and you have to, there is no way for me to move that money without you signing as well. That is not a money service business. So things like green address, things like lightning network in this section here, crystal clearly are not considered money service businesses. They are multi-signature wallets. They are not hosted wallets. They are wallets that the user directly runs themselves, directly interacts with the Bitcoin network through they are not money service businesses. So next we move on to ATMs. Um, obviously, uh, Bitcoin ATM is a, a money service business. If it is buying and, or allowing a user to buy and sell uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies through it, that's not really any kind of shock or development here. Now, the next section moves on to um, dApps or decentralized applications. Now, this is kind of a, a, a gray area here. Um, pretty much the, the, the way this is phrased here is that if this dApp is performing money transmission, if it's moving values, between um, two parties uh, acting as some kind of intermediary, it will be considered a money transmitter. It will be considered a money service business. Although personally, I think this specific section does have some degree of grayness and ability to argue specifics in a nuanced way here. Now, the next section is um, dealing with uh, anonymity enhanced CVC transactions. And so this is kind of broken up into a few different sections here. Um, firstly, um, anonymizing services. And so they break this up into two different categories here. Um, and anon anonymizing services providers and anonymizing software providers. So a uh, service provider in this case is, would be in a, the example used here is a traditional mixer. So something where you actually send your funds to the mixer, that fund or that mixer takes custody of your funds and then passes out some different coins at the other end. So they, they are actually taking custody of those funds in the middle is a money service business. So if they still exist out there anywhere, any kind of Bitcoin or crypto mixer um, like was widely available in, in years like 2012, 13, so on, is a money service business, 
they are going to be hit with all of the regulations. Now, as far as the anonymizing software, um, this is not considered a money service business because there is no intermediary party that is actually transmitting money on behalf of the user. It is the user themselves directly utilizing software to anonymize their transactions, directly interacting with the Bitcoin network. So things like Wasabi Wallets Mixer, um, Samurai's Whirlpool Mixer, these are not money service businesses. They at no time have custody or take possession of funds, at no time take possession of anything to pass it on behalf of somebody else in a payment. They are just providing a network communication layer for individual users to coordinate and construct a coin join. Oh yeah, and, and this this would apply to join market as well. Pretty much any any type of, of mixing service just coordinating a coin join is not a money service business. So any type of software like that that is just helping individual users coordinate and at no point taking possession of funds to mix funds on the blockchain is exempt, is not a money service business, does not have to comply with any of these regulations. Now, the, the next section is providers of anonymity enhanced um, convertible uh, virtual currencies. So that, that's what they're pretty much calling uh, cryptocurrencies through this entire report. Um, there's a little bit of ambiguity here. Um, decentralized privacy coins, um, the coin and the network itself do not fall into the category of an MSB, but there is a, a caveat for centralized um, CBC payment system. So things like a Xiaomi and eCash server. Something like a Xiaomi and eCash server would fall under the category of a money service business and have to comply with regulations. But honestly, even for people like myself who are a huge fan of them, that is not really any kind of shocking development here. It, it was always pretty clear that that is what regulatorily and legally they would be considered. So next up is decentralized exchanges. So these, um, I, I saw a lot of people kind of presenting this as um, declaring all DEXs money service businesses. And that's pretty much the exact opposite of what this is actually saying in, in terms of um, how they're classified. So decentralized exchanges, as long as all they are doing is operating um, a platform or a forum where buyers and sellers can post bids and offers and settlements of those, those orders are not in any way um, part of what the DEX is doing. So users' funds are always in their own wallets, completely under the user's control. Um, there is no hosted wallet um, operated by the trading platform, then it does not qualify as a, a money transmitter or a money service business. Now, I, I, I want to point out here that this in no way kind of covers them from the type of, of statements the SEC has made in terms of being securities exchanges if these type of DEXs are trading what the SEC considers to be illegal securities that can still very much bite a decentralized exchange in the ass. But as long as they are not custodying funds, they are not a money service business under FinCEN's um, position. Now, as far as ICOs go, this is, again, kind of a, a nuanced uh, area here with many different ways of trying to interpret this. Um, Pretty much the, the categorization, um, the, the way they break this apart, if I remember correctly, is whether or not um, you are selling to a closed set of preferred buyers or just generally openly. Um, in the case of selling to just a preferred group of people, um, it really comes down to how things are being distributed, what they're being used for. 
and you know how this all plays about but there are some cases where an ico can be considered a money service business based on how the raise the, the promises of future platform and the utility of the token is constructed and there are some cases where it, it will be considered a money service business so like honestly like this is a pretty dense section and so i don't really want to do this injustice here i would recommend anybody who really wants to dig into this um go read this section it's section five it starts on page 23. Uh, i'm pretty much just going to leave it at there are some cases where an ico would be considered an msb there are some cases where they would not now the the last section here is is kind of uh no i'm sorry the second to last section is um dap developers so a developer of a dap if they are just building deploying software and not using it at all themselves they are not considered an msb just for being a dap developer however if somebody was to develop a dap deploy it and then use it themselves personally to engage in anything that Finn said considered money transmission, the developer would be considered a um, money service business. So it pretty much just comes down to whether the developer gets involved in operating something that could be considered an MSB um, or not in the creation of a DAP. Um, so any developers who want to steer clear of any risk here do not go beyond actually coding and deploying something that will expose you to some risk here. Now, the last section is interestingly dealing with mining pools. And this, I think, creates a large degree of gray area here that is either going to need further clarification or could wind up causing a, a lot of problems for any kind of mining pool that is either operating in the U.S. Um, or um, has American operated miners here. So when a, and they distinguish here between a centralized mining pool and a decentralized mining pool and go on to say that in the case of a centralized mining pool, if the operator of the pool is simply having the the revenue from mining so the coin bases and the fees sent to them and then afterwards distributing it to the individual miners they are not a money service business because they are providing the service of mining and transmitting that fund to individual hardware operators is a necessary operation for running this mining operation and providing this service. So this falls into the exemption of having to transmit funds in the operation of some other, you know, um, service or, or sale of goods. But the confusing part here is if that miner or the, that pool operator has a hosted wallet that is account based integrated into the mining pool they would be considered a money transmitter or a money service business and now this is a very gray area here because pretty much all mining pools do that because there is no setup currently to really enforce we get a block it gets paid out that is not always going to be economically viable for some smaller miners who would effectively be getting peppered with small dust payments that are uneconomical, could wind up losing them a large amount of money. And so a lot of miners will just let things pile up in their pool wallet and withdraw when they want to. So this is creating a big gray area here that could have a lot of complications for mining pool operators um, that are interacting with American miners or re really any miners that would fall under FinCEN jurisdiction or wherever they want to go waving their stick around. So this is something I think that needs more clarification and potentially 
education on the consequences of trying to force this this black and white line here um, and, and why things are set up the way they are in the mining ecosystem for economical reasons on behalf of actual hardware operators. And I also think that this is going to wind up potentially spurring um, the development of more decentralized mining pool architectures because it is a way to get around this potential gray area and problem it could cause for mining operators. And so that's pretty much the, the core points that really matter to any different actors in this space uh, from the guidance report. And I do want to end with a final um, note here that people like Ryan X. Charles are absolutely retarded because it seems like they read a paragraph from the first page and just started boldly claiming that lightning nodes are money service businesses. When if they actually went through and read this entire report, would see that the exact opposite is explicitly clarified. So I am done. I need to take a second here and wet my whistle because my throat is raw. Yeah, well, I guess that was, yeah, that was the joke, man. Is a lot of people were saying that as soon as this was released, that we we're going to need a money transmitter license to operate a lightning node. And yeah, it does seem a little ridiculous. And yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, information there, but it's good information. It's good to have some clarity. Sounds like a little bit more clarity than the SEC's guidelines for ICOs and tokens offerings and all that. So yeah, I mean, uh, overall, it's a good thing to have this stuff down. I mean, you know, in the book, so we know everybody's operating accordingly. Yeah, you know, th this is, I think that this makes a lot of things that people have just stirred up FUD and bullshit about, and a lot of things that there has been legitimate worry about because of a complete lack of clarity ha have all been spelled out very clearly here. I mean, especially, you know, the, the issue with uh, lightning and all of the bullshit, I think is explicitly answered here in the section regarding multi-sig wallets and, um, you know, hosted versus non-hosted wallets. And I think uh, another very important um, clarification here, and I'm sure no part would agree with me, is the entire aspect on uh, anonymous, anonymizing services and the line as far as where one is a money service business and where one is not. Because by my reading, this is pretty much explicitly stamping things like Wasabi or other coin join uh, services as not being money service businesses. So th they're, they're effectively completely okay in jurisdictions like America. Yes, that what the lawyer said too, that now we could even move to America. <laughs> but so this this is very, very extensive, surprisingly extensive, like uh, it, it went into so much details like like multisig and things like that. And, and this is this is very great news for me and for for Wasabi. But on the other hand, this this is very bad news for other people, so I'm not going to just cheer it. <laughs> but what I'm happy that at least at least our our thing have become a uh, well clear that now what we are doing is is completely fine. So so that's that's definitely good. Yeah, and I mean you know you know like you said there are a lot of players in this space that are going to have a lot of complications to deal with because of this but it's like most importantly is like there is clarity here now like people know where everything in this ecosystem stands in terms of fincen regulations and how they're going to apply laws and i think overall despite the problem that some actors in the space are going to have to deal with overall this is a good thing because everybody knows now where their footing is standing in this ecosystem and I mean, like, even specifically with the the issue of uh, the the privacy section or the anonymity section, and how that's going to affect something like a Xiaomi and eCash server, 
well, obviously I would, I would like to see them operating completely in the dark without any kind of record keeping or regulatory operations, you know, having had some time to think about it, I do think that there is a, a way for something like a Chalamini cash server to operate in a way that is regulatory or regulatorily compliant while still having some degree of privacy. Like I, I do like you, obviously there would still be requirements for identities being attached to accounts, likely identities being attached to turning amounts from an account into Chalmian tokens. But looking at this, I, I see there potentially being room for at least payments to have some degree of anonymity. So even though my account at a Chalmian server that's complying with regulations would have my name on it, me pulling out Chalmian tokens from that would have my name on pulling out this amount of Chalmian tokens. Potentially, I could still use something where I go pay a merchant and that merchant redeems it and puts it in a KYC account, but that server still can't tell that I'm the one who just paid that merchant. So even though both of the endpoints would have a lot of record keeping, there still might be some room for at least that payment linkage to have some degree of anonymity to it. And I mean, it's obviously not the best thing in the world, but it, it's also not the worst either. I really think every developer or mathematician or researcher would vehemently not want to build a system that's, that's intentionally crippled by law. <laughs> but yeah, I see what you mean. You know, this is the law in one country and this is the law in other country. And after, after all, this is only the US. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's now we know where we can and can't move forward as far as the lawmakers and the regulators are concerned. Oh, yeah. You see, you see there, is a, there is a bit of uh, irony here because the traditional Bitcoin mixers operate in the dark and we are operating as a real company. So if you think about that, we cannot steal the money, but they can steal the money. So we should be operating in the dark and they should be operating as a completely transparent companies because <laughs> That's what would make sense. Like, uh, wow. Do, do, you, do you see this 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 controversy here? Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> world can be pretty fucking ironic sometimes. Yeah, that's some uh, irony. So uh, you want to correct the record for something we talked about last week that uh, news broke right when we exited the show? Alrighty, Blockstream Liquid Bonanza. And I once again am not getting my Blockstream show bonus because it wasn't the first story we covered. Okay, we, we got to stop doing this, guys. All right, I, I need groceries next week. All so right. um, <laughs> this is actually um, going to involve both the announcement from last week as well as one made at Consensus this week. But um. As far as last week's announcement, um, there are 14 new members of the Liquid Network. Um, Blue Fire Capital, uh, BTC Trader and BTC Turk, uh, Kobu, CoinNut, um, DMM Bitcoin, which is a big Chinese um, exchange, uh, Front FRNT Financial, uh, Gate.io, uh, Huibi, um, everybody should know them, a big Chinese exchange, Open node, uh, pool in, which is a, a mining pool actually. So that that's a kind of interesting development. Um, they're going to be hooking into Liquid to allow miners to directly withdraw through Liquid, and then have quicker access to exchanges for any miners who are going to be selling to fiat um, for whatever reason. Uh, Pricto, uh, Side Shift AI, which is a, a Shape Shift competitor. Uh, Tau Tau and Tilde. So there are now a total of 35 uh, exchanges 
OTC trading desks and legacy financial institutions um, that are working with the Liquid Network. As well, uh, Bitfinex has brought uh, Liquid Trading live. So they have completed their integration with their platform. Um, users are now able to transfer some of their Bitcoin balance into a balance on the Liquid Network. And with Finex and The Rock Trading both live, there are now two different exchanges that can be moved very quickly between um, on the Liquid Network. As well, um, BitMEX is working on integrating Liquid support for withdrawals, which is going to be a very interesting thing given how massive they are in terms of uh, volume in the ecosystem. Um, drum roll. Tether and another stable coin, Stably, are going to be launching um, their stable coins on Liquid in the near future. Uh, Kobu uh, Kwanon, which I think is another Japanese exchange, uh, Coinnut, GoPax, and Huibi are all working on their Liquid integration. So sometime in the near future, all of these exchanges should have all of the um, interfaces accessible for their users. Um, Poolin is actively working on their integration. And Bank to the Future is also um, working on integrating um, Liquid support. So it's pretty ironic. Um, <laughs> this is really developing very quickly, despite a lot of um, other media articles or media outlets that will be going unnamed. Uh, attempting to score PR points, talking about how nobody is using Liquid. Um, it, it seems to be really rolling downhill at this point with a lot of people coming online, integration, moving forward quickly, and stablecoin support coming to it, which will allow Liquid to be used for both the crypto and fiat side of arbitrage loops. So this, I think, is, is going to really move forward very quickly and over the next year or so start having very noticeable effects on the overall maturity of the market. As well, um, at Consensus this week, Blockstream has announced the Liquid Securities platform. So um, prior to this, um, setting up any kind of token launch on Liquid has pretty much been a developer-only um, thing that requires a lot of futzing around with command line interfaces, uh, low-level understandings, and a lot of opportunities to screw things up. So they have built a simple interface platform to allow uh, people to launch securities tokens on Liquid very easily through a GUI um, platform where you can issue, reissue, so expand the supply and monitor usage, as well are uh, building out a rule enforcement system through the token, which is effectively all enforced off-chain using multi-signature for smart contract enforcement and um, a liquid authorizer, which is a, a server-based system. So an actual server somewhere that's going to be enforcing things. And you know, this there's not really many details on the authorizer, but I, I can sit here and imagine this would allow you to do things in enforcing um, time locks in transactions um, from any multi-signature wallet that they apply those conditions to. Um, potentially even um, if, if some people in different regulatory climates would want to do things like enforce um, tokens so that they can only be sent to multi-signature addresses where this authorizer server would have partial control over to kind of rein in the ability to just freely and privately send them around wherever they want. And pretty much like a, really any kind of enforcement condition you could apply to a server that has a key in a multi-sig wallet could be done through a system like this. It would be very flexible, very efficient, and importantly, you know, something you can very easily update, like, you know, changing conditions for rules you're enforcing for tokens is not going to involve nuking an Ethereum smart contract, deploying things, messing around with forks. It's, it's, it would literally be as simple as just updating a server. And they're also throwing out um, API um, access for the securities platform so that things can be done more programmatically. And... Um, and announcing the, the launch of this uh, Bank to the Future, 
Tokensoft, Atomic Capital, uh, Zenus Bank, and Pixelmatic, a, uh, that's Samson Mao's uh, video game studio, are all um, looking to either launch security tokens on Liquid or integrating it into their respective platforms. And so we've seen in the, in the last two weeks, you know, it, it, it got off to a very slow roll after the network was first launched and, and all of the, the parties involved were starting to look at integration and how to actually use this. The, things are really steamrolling forward at this point. And especially if, if we start going into another bull market with lots of institutional interest in big players, I think that adoption and use of liquid is really going to speed up very quickly and they're, they're really thinking through in my opinion how to kind of apply the the types of things that different players are looking at platforms like ethereum for in a way that is not retarded uh, exposing people to all kinds of risks and means of fucking things up and making it very simple streamlined and upgradable so like i am really looking forward to seeing how this kind of plays out because we're going to see a more professionally engineered platform like this compete with shit shows like ethereum and i'm i'm kind of interested to see how big institutions and players you know react to that now that there is a choice between those two things yeah man it's finally good to see some uh liquid news continue to be uh, pushed out as far as just like actual people coming in and setting up shop to where it's going to be used in their back end and tether and bitfinex on there i'm sure it got a few people riled up but i mean these are guys that are huge in the space and uh same with hoibi and a lot of other names on that list that you called out and like you're saying i mean there's a lot of projects here locally where i talk and it's just always like you know how come we don't build this on a side chain that actually settles on bitcoin like liquid and you know that uh that argument, I don't know, it gets a little old, but now with stuff like this to get some more ammo in my weapon, I'm going to keep firing it back out. And hopefully one of these projects will take it up because that's where it's like, if, if the project is serious, then I imagine then they'll be building on Bitcoin. Like you're saying, I mean, there's a lot of places for an Ethereum contract to go wrong. And uh, the settlement aspect of it is uh, kind of ridiculous too, now that they've worked a couple of times. So yeah, it'll be good to actually see some real projects get built out with a system that has a solid foundation on it, under it. No par, Janine? You guys have any uh, input on the giant uh, lizard conspiracy bringing the Bilderberg group in, into Bitcoin land? Anything? Yeah, I don't think they are coming out of the ground. <laughs> They're already locked up in their bunkers getting ready. <laughs> well, I mean, like this, it's it is, it's just an, an interesting thing from a, a curiosity point of view because you have a lot of these big players just being cluelessly stupid when it comes to, you know, things like ICOs, these security tokens, like all of this nonsense. And I, I, I want to see if some of them are, are going to wise up and use a much more intelligently engineered platform now that it's available. And, you know, I've, I've went into this when we covered the, the forward contracts that their or Blockstream is working on with Crypto Garage. Like I'm really kind of interested to see how the legacy financial players and products and things start moving into this space because I think that really is an underestimated potential for what this stuff can really do for the global financial system that people don't really think about that much because everybody's just obsessed over my retail payments. Like, well, when can I go buy Bitcoin or when can I go buy Starbucks with Bitcoin? And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of surprising to me. Nobody's really interested in this type of stuff. Well, they'll get used to yeah, man. Once they realize it's out there and it's something that they work with, it would be interesting to see as far as like who does migrate over. I mean, we've been seeing some people that are legacy in the, you know, 
markets and they're starting to wise up. I mean, we got that story a little later with uh, Microsoft now talking about other retailers and stuff like that. Not such a good story, but we'll get to those. All right, Janine, come on. It's it's comment toll time. Cough up the comment to move along. Janine. <laughs> I think she's went and took a tea time or something. All righty then. I guess let's move along. All right, man. Let's do it. Bitfinex updates on the initial exchange offering, as well as the ongoing court case uh, with the Attorney General in New York. So uh, first up, the IEO. Um, Bitfinex has been able to raise a billion dollars uh, tether in 10 days in a private sale, um, raising money both from... Um, large industry players, as well as large users, uh, respectively uh, greater than 100 million or a million for each individual person who participated in this sale. And, you know, as far as balancing the books go, um, this pretty much deals with the entire Tether issue. And for, for anybody confused on how uh, raising Tethers uh, is is going to accomplish this in any way? Um, just walk walk through this with me. Let's imagine they literally just took a billion dollars in cash. Okay, well, then they just toss that back in the tether accounts and everything's fine. But raising tether accomplishes the exact same thing because those tethers that were raised through this IEO have effectively been removed from circulation. Those are, are no longer liabilities of Tether to redeem from Tether reserves. They are now Bitfinex's liability in terms of whatever the, the terms of this equity offering are. And so now the things are still balanced out. Like and, and given the fact that Tether had something like two and a half something billion dollars in outstanding liabilities, a billion have now been removed and transferred as a liability to Bitfinex, uh, Tether's reserves should in, in this situation be completely back to normal. If all of the outstanding Tether were to suddenly bank run the reserves, they would have enough to meet that. And now all of the liability is completely centered on Bitfinex and the terms of whatever arrangement they've made with people who made or put money into this IEO. And so really like there, there is like Tether is fine at this point. Like they are solvent. They would be able to redeem every single outstanding Tether at this point. And everything has been shuffled back to Bitfinex. Like there, there is no more crossed books. Like this line of credit that they have drawn on is not an issue that could spill over from Bitfinex to Tether. So theoretically, like if this case with the attorney general was to just go completely south and lead to Bitfinex imploding on itself, Tether would be able to continue operating as normal without any kind of financial fallout from that. And now to move over to the ongoing court case, um, last time we talked about this, um, the attorney general and Bitfinex's lawyers were pretty much told to attempt to come to an arrangement with the attorney general's office and then file it with uh, Judge Cohen. That um, was not able to be done. So Tether and Finex's filing is pretty much um, looking at four major um, conditions for the injunction that the attorney general was attempting to file. Um, the first of which um, and all of these would remain in effect effectively for 45 days after which the attorney general would have to show cause to extend the injunction beyond that. So the first 
condition that Finex is willing to agree to is one, further action by Tether to make loans or engage in similar transactions that would result in Bitfinex or other affiliated parties having claims to the USD reserves being held by Tether, such as the line of credit transaction that was the subject of the petition. Without limiting the foregoing, for avoidance of doubt, this order shall not preclude other activities in the ordinary course of business. So in other words, um, they're, they're agreeing that for the next 45 days, if the judge were to find these terms acceptable, Bitfinex will not draw any further money from this line of credit. Um, this uh, seems pretty logical given how this IEO has gone. Now, the attorney general wanted to put this uh, in a language that would effectively extend beyond preventing them from drawing on that line of credit, but also um, prevent Tether from doing anything with Tether reserves except leave sitting in a bank account. And also, um, prevent anybody affiliated in any way with any of these companies from redeeming Tether. So the, the way I read that is potentially even simply a, a shareholder would not be allowed to redeem any Tether they will. Now that seems a little overreaching and a little excessive. Uh, the, the second term that they want to propose for the injunction is pretty much have an injunction against making any distribution or dividend to any principal, executive, employee, agent, investor, or associate of Bitfinex and Tether from the funds that have been loaned, extended, pledged, or otherwise taken from the USD reserves held by Tether. And for the avoidance of further doubt, the foregoing shall not preclude payments in the ordinary course of business, including for payroll, payments to vendors, consultants, or contractors. So in other words, nothing is allowed to be done with this money besides continuing to redeem withdrawals or pay for the business of operations. Now, the, OE, the Attorney General's office, again, was attempting to be way more strict here with this point. Um, and wanted to insert the language non-reserve funds. Now, Bitfinex and Tether took issue with this because th there is no real earmarked accounts that are specifically reserves versus non-reserves. And things like the interest and money made off of investments with reserves are what they use to pay um, for the operations of their business. And so they object to this because let's say, um, although in their words, they do not think this would happen. If Tether was to somehow become unprofitable, the way the attorney general's office wanted to phrase this would effectively mean they would have to stop paying all their employees, all their expenses. The, the company would effectively be completely unable to operate. And they're arguing that this is pretty much a gross overreach of the attorney general's authority in this matter. The um, third one is pretty much um, verbatim what the attorney general proposed for this. And it is a long rambling thing I'm not going to read directly, but it effectively boils down to um, not tampering with, destroying, obscuring any kind of records involved um, with Bitfinex or Tether's operations stored in any kind of office premises or private residence of any employee involved, including personal communications of different employees, directors, um, so on and so forth. Um, the attorney general has no objection to this. This this is pretty much exactly from what the attorney general wanted during the negotiations before it failed. And like I initially said, um, the, the attorney general is pretty much trying to get this injunction to last indefinitely 
unless Bitfinex provides records that they have requested. Now, Finex has provided most of the specific records that they have requested, but the, the request for records from the Attorney General's office has been set up in an unbelievably vague way that it not only demands a, a number of records going back that really don't have anything to do with the specific thing the Attorney General is looking into, would be a huge burden for Finex and Tether to supply, but is also open-ended to the point where it's effectively the anything that we ask for that we haven't already asked for. And the Attorney General is trying to structure this so that the injunction would not be lifted until they are satisfied that they have had all of the records they want produced. Now, given that, again, it's open-ended with language tantamount to anything we ask for, the attorney general would effectively be able to keep the injunction open indefinitely, just requesting arbitrary records or saying records have not been given to our satisfaction. And they would be in a position where they just arbitrarily decide when it's okay to lift the injunction. And that just seems absolutely crazy especially given that the charges they have not actually filed yet relate to the Martin Act, which is specifically dealing with securities fraud in New York. And one of the key things the judge went into at the last hearing was whether or not Tether constituted a security. And it does not meet one of the main points of being a security in the common enterprise and expectation of profit. So what the attorney general's office is trying to do here is claim they are going to file a charge under the Martin Act that they have not filed or revealed yet. They want to keep this injunction open indefinitely until they actually file this charge that they have not named yet that would probably get thrown out because the most core things defining whether something is a security or not is not met by Tether. And so we, we still have to see how the, the judge responds to this as well as what the attorney general's office files. But like this to me personally just seems insane and absurd to the degree of just abusing the legal system to hamstring a business with really no justifiable reason and just an insane overreach of the attorney general's authority. And so I think most likely what will end up happening is some kind of combination of the filing from Finex and the attorney general's office is what the judge will rule on. But I would be shocked if the 45 day automatic expiry of the injunction or some default time limit after which it expires is not included in whatever the judge ends up enforcing because anything else is just effectively batshit insane. Yeah, I mean, that's what, you know, we thought of whenever these things first came out. It was insane and a gross overreach. And I mean, it's New York, man. And if they don't have their hands in a large pocket that, you know, that they can get their hands in, they're going to try. And, uh, you know, I think it's just insane that it was a billion dollars raised in 10 days. I mean, that's a sign of like people's confidence with Bitfinex as a platform. And, you know, I mean, yeah, that covers any sort of uh, loss that they potentially had. And now that they have all this, you know, all this money in there, I mean, why should they have this injunction indefinitely? I mean, I've seen, you know, yeah, they're trying to do some pushback now and uh, get that lifted. And it seems like that would be the, you know, rightful thing to do if you believe in a free market or something like that. But I don't know. This is the New York Attorney General. All right. No para. Janine, any comments? Well, just to use your thing, like you you shouldn't you should not have tell us before the before the digest that you met with Phil because now we know that uh, he paid you. <laughs> so. That's what happened. Of course, all this broke right after you talked to Phil. 
You got me. I'm I'm a I'm a, a fucking I'm I'm a show for everybody. I'll just I'll just say whatever the fuck anybody who gives me money wants. Yep, totally me. <laughs> Alrighty though, uh, Janine, you, you want to take us into the next one and give my voice box a, a break here for a minute? <laughs> yeah. So um, probably many of you have seen that um, Jameson Lop tweeted last month that he would be publishing research on fake Toshi. Uh, but that it, the publication was delayed. Um, he said it was actually been done for a few weeks, but it was delayed due to the need for legal review. And he claimed that 30 to 40% of my findings didn't make it into the final draft due to legal issues. Uh, finally, on May 8th, that research was published in Bitcoin Magazine. Um, I didn't see it published anywhere else, but I didn't really look. Um, but according to the one, the version he published in Bitcoin Magazine, which he titled How Many Wrongs Make a Right, um, a lot of it is a thorough summary of prior findings um, and investigations over the years by various um, researchers, uh, programmers, uh, media outlets, et cetera, since 2015, which is when Craig Wright claimed to be Satoshi for the first time publicly. Um, and he included discrepancies in the writing style between Satoshi and fake Toshi, uh, their opinions and Bitcoin design choices and the reasons for them, as well as analysis of his various failed attempts at proofs that he controlled certain coins. Um, also his PhD degree uh, actually being a few master's degrees and that he didn't really have that big of a substantive uh, academic record, which is kind of funny because um, if you've watched some of the talks, uh, there was one at DEF CON about, you know, how researchers get their um, papers published in various academic journals and such. It's actually not that hard to fake your way into academic infamy, but uh, he apparently didn't want to even do that baseline work. So, uh, uh, yeah, few master's degrees, no PhD. And also there was reports... Um, on various legal entities that he has allegedly set up for the purposes of running a tax rebate scheme against the Australian government. Uh, and of course, there was a section on Calvin Iyer's offshore gambling empire that, quote, takes advantage of jurisdictional arbitrage. And he actually um, acknowledged this himself in a, Al, Calvin Iyer did in an interview with Forbes where he said, we run a business that can't actually be described as gambling in each country we operate in, but when you add it all together, it's internet gambling. Uh, and obviously James Salop also added some of his own research. Um, the one thing I noticed that he did himself was he looked into um, whether fake Toshi's claims of doing military, military service were significant in any way. And it turns out that he really didn't do that great of a job and, and his, his service was basically insignificant. Um, so if it wasn't obvious to everyone <laughs> already that this guy is a lying sack of shit and, uh, you know, you haven't read up on all of this um, backstory, then this is the perfect summary for everything that you can keep in mind whenever he demands more attention for his bogus ideas and projects. Yeah, and importantly new people in this space or anybody who knows new people in this space, this is the thing to point them to. Don't waste time trying to give a shorthand rundown. Don't waste time arguing with them. Just link them to this and tell them to read it. It's, it's archived absolutely everywhere at this point. So it's not going anywhere. Like it's time to stop wasting all of our days arguing with idiots or, or people who just don't have all the background knowledge, just point them to this and wash your hands of it. Anybody who reads this and, and doesn't get it is just willfully deluding themselves. Cricket, cricket. This this would make a good good digest highlight, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I was uh, looking forward to getting this article from Lop. So yeah, it's good to see it out finally. Alrighty, 
I'm being dumped. I'm being dumped right back into the, the rant, the rant hole, aren't I? Yeah, man, we got to rearrange these uh, stories next time to make sure you're not getting a marathon of talking. But yeah, I think this is, might be your uh, your last one. Then we can really take a break. All right, all right, two more, two more to go for me. All right, all right, let's get into it. So Microsoft has announced uh, the launch of a. Uh, they're pretty much their first implementation of their decentralized identity program. Uh, the implementation is called the ION network, and it's going to be launching on the Bitcoin network, um, not Bcash, not Ethereum, not any other shitcoin, uh, Bitcoin. And interestingly enough, um, some different companies that are looking into running nodes early on are Equinox or Equinix, a data center and interconnection company. Uh, Casa is actually looking at this. Um, Learning Machine, um, they provide tools and services for kind of issuing and time stamping official records anchored to a blockchain. Civic, which Ah, but hopefully this gets Vinny to stop being a retard and realize that the token part of Civic is completely retarded and pointless. And Cloudflare. So this is a, a nice balance of uh, you know two company or three companies actually in this ecosystem and two major infrastructure providers for the internet overall. So. You know, hopefully, to, like looking at this, we can get a good hardcore user base within this ecosystem using this. And other companies can really start trying to push this mainstream while those of us within the ecosystem already can start helping work out the kinks and really get this streamlined into something that normal people can use. So I'm, I'm going to keep this real short and simple but um, the, the protocol being used is called SideTree. And pretty much what it is doing is acting as a, a bridge, I guess you could say, between the Bitcoin blockchain, where it's going to be anchoring and timestamping commitments to all of the data involved, and a content addressable storage system, which um, for now it looks like they're going to be using uh, IPFS and kind of intermediating between those. So the, the Bitcoin blockchain is going to be used to actually anchor and order everything involved in creating, updating, and navigating the system. And a content addressable storage system is going to be used so that all of the, the actual information involved is going to be widely accessible and searchable. And, you know, the gist of it really is there's effectively a two point anchor um, where all of the the operations on creating or updating any kind of identity information is condensed into a batch file which is then linked to an anchor file that gets linked into the the bitcoin blockchain and pretty much um there, there are going to be a number of uh optimizations in terms of the the batch file is going to help you coordinate what is actually in a chunk the anchor file is coordinating what is in that batch file and things will be merkleized so that you can get localized receipts to prove the inclusion of specific things without having to you know parse through or deal with massive amounts of data and effectively, the, the gist of it is you, you would go and you would register a decentralized identity tied to a public key. That would get batched by a side tree node. That would wind up um, being committed to in a batch file than the anchor file and the Bitcoin blockchain. And this, this registry is going to include the public key, which is your identity, as well as a recovery key or deletion key which would allow you to recover your identity if your primary key was lost or if, if you wanted to delete it and invalidate it 
uh, from the identity system. And there's also in the, um, the, the system is going to be using a, a transaction structure for these kinds of update processes. And each of these transactions um, is involving kind of a, an incrementing number so that however they wind up being committed to in the blockchain, you can see a canonical ordering um, to resolve any kind of conflicts or you know what, what came first and what is valid in terms of any updates or operations on an ID as well as a service point um, or service points that can be looked at. So like the, the last time we kind of went into um, the architecture of this system in depth, like this allows you to have that identity that is totally independent of any service, like an email provider or something like Twitter and allows you to point people towards specific service providers. So like if I want you to know go here to validate my ID against something, you see where to go. Or if I'm trying to share some data with you that I have stored encrypted to my identity um, in some other server, I can have that included in the service point and you know where to go. And just overall, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice done architecture, although not at all complete or finalized or beyond iterations and improvements at this point to kind of give you that that identity that isn't within any provider or services power to take away from you, but still allow you to utilize services or providers of different things in secure private ways where you have control over what is done with your identity, where you have control over what's done with your private information. And it's the, the, the importance of something like this in the world today on the internet cannot be understated, especially just looking at the, the outright insanity at this point with platforms like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube just selectively deplatforming people or, or some would say depersoning them when you literally just take away the digital identity that everybody knows is tied to them that people use to ensure they're talking to a specific person or you know selective financial suppression uh, preventing people from utilizing the the monetizing aspects of these different platforms it's like this is probably the most critical thing the internet needs in this day and age besides a form of money that can stand up to this type of shit. And it's amazing to see Microsoft actually building this properly and thinking it through, like especially given the, the traditional perception of that company in, in, on the internet overall. All right, no par, you, you can start shilling Microsoft now. So I think this is great. <laughs> I I was never a fan of identity on the blockchain because I tried it myself. I tried to build it myself. I tried to figure out myself. And basically, the largest problem that you run into is that you need instant liquidity, like like with coin giants. You need instant instant. Uh, instant users otherwise it's just not gonna be like useful but that's what microsoft can get and it really looks like uh, they are doing this in the right way i'm i'm still just cautiously optimistic but 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 let's see that maybe maybe it's something that even we could use and we could get value out of it <laughs> finally a blockchain product that 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 you would even use yourself right like you see mm -hmm. the value that's that's i think that's that's great uh going to the airport don't have to take your passport you just have to provide the identity whatever however they they solved the how you tie the identity to yourself and how how someone cannot steal the identity and things like that. So, yeah, uh, well, I mean, let's that's, see. 
I, th- I think that kind of stuff is a little far out in the future in, in terms of like transitioning to like government approved IDs and stuff. Although I definitely think that's easily done in the long term. I'm just, I'm more interested in like the, the digital identity, you know, like people look for me, Brian underscore trolls on, on Twitter, but Twitter can take that away from me the second they want to. And there's nothing I can do about that. And to have an alternative that, that I can use to identify myself, that people can use to interact with me, that no company like Twitter can just take away, like that's big enough in its own right, I think. Like I, I'm willing to sit here and wait like 10 years until they start moving into things like, you know, passport replacement or like official like government notarized credentials and stuff. I, I don't really care about that in the short term. I want replacements for the things like, you know, your Twitter identity. Yeah, I, I think you bring up an interesting question there. Uh, what happens to people? Like, because on your mobile or, or, or on a lot of places, uh, you register, you just download a new, I don't know, workout app or something like that. Then you, you register there usually with your facebook or your google or your twitter or 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 some some kind of you know silicon valley company but a bit convenience because it's convenient for you and what happens to those people who got the platform then they registered with their identities or the they they just lost their their they just lost the access to to all of their whatever stupid apps on that's that's what happens or 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 what's with that do you know yeah like they, they pretty much get locked out of everything ah uh, i see yeah i didn't even think about this use case i don't know how 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 significant is that because i don't hear people talk about these kind of problems so but yeah, that's, that's definitely something there. But um, sorry, you, uh, were you gonna say something though, Janine? Yeah, so I'm I'm also not a fan of blockchain identity projects. Um, the only reason that I have less skepticism for this one is mostly due to the fact that I'm like I mean I don't like Microsoft, but I'm aware of the general discussion. Um, between the people that are involved in this particular project. For example, um, Christopher Allen is one of the people that I've especially read um, with his, regarding his work with these kinds of projects. And he seems to be, I don't know if he's, I haven't checked whether he's directly involved, but he, he definitely was cited um, at least by um, the guy at Microsoft as being like an inspiration behind it. So if, as long as the principles that I've heard him talk about and the, you know, the, the risks that it might entail if they don't do it right, um, as long as that's inspiring the design of it, then I'm, I don't have any uh, criticisms of it at the moment. And probably this is the only project that in terms of like blockchain identity projects that I would put any faith in at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, like also like this is, is not, something exclusively being done just by microsoft i mean like this is something that it's it's being collaborated with with the decentralized identity foundation and i mean like just like some of the companies involved with that are microsoft ibm uh civic accenture um trying to look for the ones that everybody doesn't hate um yeah yes. exactly like i literally don't like any of those companies <laughs> but so all i'm saying is yeah if it's an open source thing and other people outside of those companies are able to work on it and it's not you know being gatekeeped by these companies then i'm fine with that mm -hmm. and it's like that's that's where the, like the core value of this is going to be it's like it's it's completely open and decentralized like i i make my id on this and I could go make an account on Twitter with it and Facebook and, and Google or like random stupid apps like Nopara was talking about. And if Google bans me, 
whatever. I still have my core identity that I linked in with everything else. Like Google cannot just like shut me out of everything I'm involved with on the internet because the core of that is not in the control of any of these companies. And like that is an absolutely critical change necessary on the internet going forward, just given how insanely politicized all, all of these companies are getting. Yeah, I mean, it's great to see Microsoft doing something. I mean, like we've seen CSU Wildcat, uh, Daniel B on Twitter, talk for a while about this project he's been working on. And it's been interesting to see it actually spelled out in, you know, this uh, ion and the side tree and the way it works. It's, uh, you know, I'm still digging into it myself, but it certainly sounds like it's something that's going to be useful in the future. So, yeah, mad props to Daniel B for helping out. Already ready for the next one. Yeah, man, let's talk about some space stuff. All right. So, uh, Gotenna and Blockstream have partnered to integrate Gotenna with the Blockstream satellite feed. And so, um, Richard Myers uh, from Gotenna ha has written a, a Python script that can be used to hook up a Gotenna device directly to your machine um, using a, a node um, that it, it is or is not hooked up to the, the Blockstream satellite feed and create a lot of room for synergy between these two things. So like, let's say, I don't let, let's say you have like one node hooked up to the Blockstream satellite feed and a, a bunch of offline devices or even internet connected devices that have go tennis hooked up that one block stream feed can take messages from their lightning api system and bounce those around through the go tennis mesh network to all of the other devices in the area that don't have uh, an access to that satellite feed so you can extend that that system that communications channel to people who don't directly have a satellite dish to pick up that feed themselves. And for, for instance, like, let's say that you have a, a satellite node hooked up that isn't connected to the internet. This would allow you to broadcast your transaction through a Gotenna mesh network and let it bounce around until it finds a node hooked up to the internet and broadcast your transaction out to the wider Bitcoin network. So this would allow a private relay network for transaction broadcasting too, which would come with a lot of huge privacy benefits. And even phones hooked up into like the, this kind of ad hoc symbiosis between the satellite feed and not could allow a transaction to bounce out to a phone with SMS access instead of internet connection and get your transaction out to the Bitcoin network that way. So like the, this, this tool allows the, the satellite feed and, and a Gotenna mesh network to kind of mesh together <laughs> into a single cohesive way to bounce data up and down, both for transactions and this messaging API that Blockstream is operating. And so like th this is an awesome development here. And like really <laughs> the one thing I, I wanna see is this setup to be able to relay compact blocks as well because if you can do that then you can get a mining operation set up off the grid that just relays your your block header in the compact block filter out through a mesh network until it hits a phone connection or an internet connection and you can mine off the grid as well I mean, like th this is exactly the kind of, of physical infrastructure redundancy and compatibility that, that we need going forward to really have a, a robust network that can handle adversarial conditions in, in localized parts of it. Heck yeah, man. This is one of those stories with uh, the Blockstream satellite. It was the first story for Block Digest. And I mean, the go tenant you know, stories have been coming along and then we get the lightning API and the messaging API. And now we just throw it all together. Like you're saying, a mesh of uh, the mesh networks and these uh, robust systems that are, you know, just not at 
they're not they're adverse to just going down like uh, we see or being controlled with uh, other means of communication. So, yeah, it's just awesome to see it all coming together like this. And that's an interesting thing you just said, talking about getting compact blocks and mining off the grid. Seems like miners would want to be like, you know, steady, quick connections and everything. But if there's a way to do it and get off the grid even more, those miners would do it. I know it. Well, that's the beauty. Like if if you had, if you had a mining farm set up somewhere remote with the satellite feed to get everything, like all the transactions as they're coming in, then when you find a block, all you need is the header and a filter for the compact blocks. And you just relay that out and it's only like a couple kilobytes. So that can hop through a mesh network pretty quickly and then get out to the internet and the wider network. And so like there would be some latency disadvantage but not much and so it, it, it's like it wouldn't be the most competitive thing but it, it would be possible to do yeah man it's gonna be hard to say a reason why uh the bitcoin network isn't on any part of the globe once we get some more of these satellites up in the air and more of these uh you know go tennas and I mean, it's really going to spur up a market, a secondary market. I could imagine other, you know, uh, competitors entering the market, but that's all good. I mean, more robust, honestly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and believe me, this is is not the end of uh, of Bitcoin related ideas coming out of Gotenna. Heck yeah, man. All right, so Janine, you want to take us into another way you're going to get a full node on your phone it looks like uh well we'll see so um to start off so i'm in the early stages of writing the third document for my revision control journalism research and one of the resources i'm looking at right now it talks about how you should generally not trust articles that purely derive their material from press releases because uh, they're usually the cheapest sources of revenue for online news since the writers rarely add their own commentary or do verification. Uh, and there's all a bunch of moral hazards in that. But that being said, uh, we had previously talked about HTC making a, quote, native blockchain phone called Exodus last summer in episode 118. And this announcement or that announcement announcement at the time was endorsed by Charlie Lee, who tweeted that he would be an advisor for that project. Um, and if you don't remember, the idea was to build a custom hardware um, for a smartphone that's designed for securely holding crypto keys and running applications related to cryptocurrencies. And then on May 11th, recently, it was announced by HTC that this Exodus smartphone will be launched. And I don't know if that means that the official sale will start um, in Q3 2019, or that's when they will be delivered, but it says they will be launched in Q3 2019. And um, they're now claiming that this phone will also be able to run a Bitcoin full node, which is not a surprising goal. Like a lot of people have been trying to do this. And that's why there's been an emphasis on, you know, being responsible with block space usage and all of that. Um, but something that struck me as kind of a red flag flag when I was reading it is that Phil Chen, who calls himself the decentralized chief officer at HTC, um, said in the press release or as commentary in addition to the press release that the phone will, will not be able to mine for Bitcoin itself, but we have upcoming partners to announce that will offer hash rates. So this isn't really clear at all. And so I'm not sure if he's talking about actually like making a mining pool using these phones um i don't even i don't this doesn't make sense to me and if that's the case uh i don't really know how i feel about them you know having any of that. like i don't know why the phones would need to be involved with hash rate uh because my perspective is that the device you use to mine or be involved in even pool mining requires, you know, great network connectivity and expenditure of resources. And that kind of device would be 
separate from the one that I would want to use to hold keys, which ideally should be lower power and isolatable from the internet. So these seem like two conflicting designs and I would be skeptical that they can effectively op optimize the hardware for this smartphone to fit for both use cases to the de degree that it would be more secure than you know, a regular smartphone. Um, so I don't really know because they even say in this press release article in Bitcoin Magazine that um, they can't offer details and it says additional technical details will be available closer to the product's commercial release. So I don't know, are you, do you, do you, does that part make any sense to you guys? Did, did you get the same interpretation I did when he said offering hash rates? Yeah, I, I, I wish I could give a little more insight into that. Uh, Phil actually uh, made the, the announcement for it at the Magical Crypto Conference, but I was kind of running around like a chicken with my head cut off most of the time, so I didn't have a chance to you know, actually pay attention to the presentation for that. Yeah, I'm kind of drawing a blank on what exactly that would be used for with the Bitcoin network. Yeah, I mean, I like I the the node use case that makes sense, like there's phones that are doing that, although I would still say like, if you're also going to say that you want to hold keys on that, I mean, most people don't advise having your node run on the same device where you store your keys. That just seems like because like the whole point of cold storage is to not have it on an interconnected device an internet connected device. So if, if your phone is going to be running as a node, then I mean, uh, so I don't know, it depends on what kind of, what kind of storage model they're aiming for and how much security they claim to have. But the, the hash rate part and like the phone won't be doing mining, but we'll have partners offering hash rate. That sounds like some kind of mining pool or cloud mining scheme to me. And that, makes much less sense than just a node running on the phone yeah i mean i i can't really like pull anything sensical out of that um i don't know maybe, maybe i can go back and look at the video for the presentation and we can touch on that again next episode real quick yeah it's just i don't know this is what happens when you do articles that are basically just copy paste of press releases you don't like i wish the person who wrote this article would have asked more questions or at least maybe asked the questions even though they can't offer direct details from that they should point out that that's not clear and they should make that clear because at the moment i'm like what this doesn't make sense to me also just like uh yeah i mean because that doesn't really make sense to me either and i mean just right now the cell phone market is crazy i mean smartphones already topped out and now we're seeing this uh you know, these companies kind of scramble for what to do next. Some of them are going ultra fancy, super priced foldable phones or privacy centric phones or, you know, heavy duty phones. And then now there's a trend to build a solid mid range phone that uh, is not as ridiculously priced as smartphones. So all of those guys are kind of scrambling to figure out what their next move is. Yeah, and the I mean the problem is like as a person who refuses to use smartphones for so many things that people expect you to use smartphones for and how much I've looked into, you know, can smartphones actually be secure? I mean, there are some ways you can mitigate all of the major problems, but at the end of the day, the phone networks, like the network, not the devices, is the biggest problem, and it's one of the biggest vulnerabilities, and that requires, like, uh, you know, changing and updating infrastructure that users cannot control. So as long as your phone is within this network and is, you know, vulnerable to those problems, um, there's not, you, you know, you can do as much as you can, but at the end of the day, that's out of your control. And so I still am, I mean, running a, a, running a phone note is okay, but having that mixed in with storing actual keys and everything, that makes me a bit worried. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. I mean, like, wonder if you could do something with, like, 
not cloud mining, but, uh, you know, GPU mining, some like low latency mining that you could do on a phone. And then you could sort of make a promise that you're not going to sell your customers data because we're going to be making money off of mining from your phone. But uh, I don't know. That's maybe we're, I think, I think of. maybe we're overthinking this and they're talking about shit coin mining. <laughs> I'm sure we're overthinking it a little bit, but that's all right. Like you're saying, uh, we'll dig up some more details and I'm sure we'll get another press release uh, talking about this because there's definitely a lot of different ways to go. I mean, a full node, you're talking about, you know, maybe some sort of hot wallet device. It's not meant to hold a bunch or maybe it's a, a cold storage thing. I don't know, but that all has to deal with what kind of network you're on and everything. So yeah, different implementations need to be tested out and the market will definitely come with some that fail. All right, but let's get into something that we'll see what the market thinks of this. So we talk a lot about mainstream adoption and what that could look like. Well, we got some news this week that could be showing us how that gets built out. Credit to I Am Nomad for having the fastest Twitter trigger out there and breaking the story. Now, before I start, there are some major caveats, but uh, we'll discuss that in a bit. So if you didn't notice on Twitter over the past week, Tyler Winklevoss has been gushing over Bitcoin. He made a little thread about using Bitcoin for an email system to avoid spam and paying for people's time. Then he even said, quote, should we rename blockchain week to Bitcoin week with his joy rocket thumbs up emojis? And uh, I guess he should be excited. Gemini is at the center of this new development with major retailers accepting Bitcoin. All right, let's get back to that. First off, what retailers are we talking about and what are the mechanics of this transa transactions? It's a pretty long list of retailers, but here we go. Whole Foods, Home Depot, Nordstrom, Crate and Barrel, Regal Cinemas, GameStop, Baskin Robbins, Petco, Lowe's, Office Depot, and Starbucks. So uh, that's a lot of options, although I don't know how much longer GameStop's going to be in business. Anyway, on to the transaction. So if you want to take advantage of these retailers accepting Bitcoin, then you're going to need to download the Spendin app. It's spelled S-P-E-D-N, but pronounced Spindin, trying to, uh, I don't know, maybe make a market off the meme of HODL with another misspelled word. But right now the app is only for iPhone users, so Apple users only, and you have to get an invite code for access. The app uses the Flexa payment scanner system, which allows you to spend four separate forms of cryptocurrency, those being Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum and the Gemini dollar. Now, Gemini will handle the back end of all these transactions, which essentially puts all this information in their hands to uh, change the ledger how they see fit. So it's not really spending Bitcoin because these retail, the retailers still aren't actually holding the underlying asset. It's an interesting attempt at creating a system that could rival Coinbase's new crypto card and other debit credit card implementations. Tyler Winklevoss had this to say about these developments, quote, the idea of living on crypto is now a reality. You can do it for the consumer. It's like being green. I don't know, man. There's a long list of retailers there, but I wouldn't want to be forced to go to those outlets. Then I have an Android phone with no invite code, so I'm out the game. I think the reality is this will be a system used minimally by people who want to help optimize this crypto bank business solution. And to be honest, I'm not sure if this is the solution. I mean, Flexa has their own altcoin called Flexacoin or Flexcoin that's used for staking and collateral for allowing merchants to accept unconfirmed payments. And also built into the system is the option for these retail outlets to create their own shitcoin rewards programs. So overall, it's an interesting concept and an attempt at taking on the debit card market but I don't know how helpful it will be for actually scaling Bitcoin. We have Lightning and Liquid on the way. And right now we have the Cash Card and Cash App. Well, all these are options for U.S. investors with Bitcoin to spend their Bitcoin. None of them are really ideal. So I guess I at least applaud their effort for trying to do something different. But uh, yeah, what do you guys think about this whole system and the option to go spend your Bitcoin at Whole Foods? I mean... <clears throat> I, like things like this are going to catch on and going to be popular. I mean, it's 
it, it is what it is. And I don't really have a problem with that. But I would like to see them like try to engineer these types of things to have some degree of privacy preservation, you know, especially with these, these new FinCEN um, guidelines put out and some clarification on things like companies like Gemini building products like this, like get your lawyers together and see what room there is for systems built on Xiaomi and eCash. Like, I mean, at least try to build this system in a way where you're not data mining what I'm spending my money on. Like, yeah, th like th there's no way around like having to KYC me for an account and to withdraw tokens and stuff like that. But like you, you can at least try to protect your users from consumer data mining. And, I mean, it's like, just, just take like those steps at least. Cause like these, these types of things are going to exist. They're going to be widely used. I mean, <clears throat> like it, if, if they were designed the way I'd like to see them, I would use them. But, like, just, just make the effort at least to, to push the boundaries that little bit forward that Bitcoin lets you instead of literally just rebuilding the old system one-to-one. -one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely think there's going to be some more of this going on as far as just people trying to find a way to get people the ability to spend their Bitcoin. And like you're saying, I mean, I was looking for the app and then that's when I realized like it was just for Apple users. And I mean, because, you know, I wouldn't mind if a uh, price keeps going up, maybe go buy a steak to celebrate, you know, but uh, yeah, we'll have to see. Do so you guys have any more comment? No, Para Janine. Not really. I agree with Shinobi about that. Well, they should try for privacy, but I, I don't know. Xiaomi Nikesh is just complicated system, but I'm pretty sure there are lower, lower hanging fruits there too. In, in fact, if we are going into that and talking about Apple, uh, you all remember Apple Pay, right? When it was really hot. I think that's where they ruined it. Uh, they they could have even take over, take over this whole cryptocurrency nonsense by just building privacy into their system, and <laughs> they didn't do that. So, so otherwise, it it would have have a chance of really taking off. I I think. Yeah. Sorry, Shinobi, what were you going to say? Uh, I was just going to go, yeah, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need uh, people to think about privacy more often, but, you know, it's just uh, one of the things in the background. But hopefully people start taking notice that that's important to people. All right, so going on to a rather quick story because it's really just a... Uh, little bit of information here. So BACT has been putting out blog posts regularly now since their contracts were supposed to launch late last year. First, they said sometime in April, and now they are saying July. In July is when we are supposed to see some of these early participants of that system being able to actually use the platform. From their post, quote, in conjunction with our exchange and clearing partners at ICE, We'll be working with our customers over the next several weeks to prepare for user acceptance testing, UAT, for futures in custody, which we expect to start in July. We'll provide more details in upcoming posts, but we expect to use UAT to ensure that customers have time to onboard and contest the trading and custody model we've built to their satisfaction, close quote. So, yeah, there's not much new outside of this little recent factoid and uh, given the proclivity to delay and push back, it's hard to say this will actually happen until we are past July and the contracts have either launched or not. But I mean, you know, if Fidelity is really going to start trading in a couple of weeks, I mean, you know, I everything kind of comes out in a couple of competitors at the same time. So maybe it'll be the truth this time. Maybe in July we will actually see these contracts go out. But yeah, so that's all for the backed update. You guys think That'll actually be ready. 
Yeah, I th I think if they, <clears throat> I think coming out with a, a rough shot at a launch time means that things are probably going well with uh, New York State for the uh, the trust license that they're applying for to be able to kind of bypass the CFTC uh, exemption they would have needed otherwise. Yeah, I mean, July's right around the corner. I mean, they did say at the beginning of the year, April, and that was four months away. July's just a couple of months away. So, yeah, hopefully we will see these things launch. All right, well, uh, come on. I, I'm instituting the comment toll. Again, no par and Janine. Pay up. I refuse. <laughs> Comments on back to coming in July. All right. You know, I can just sit here and make silly noises until I get Okay, a here's my comment. I don't care about backed contracts. <laughs> That's what I figured. No, Para, come on. I, I don't understand that, but probably I wouldn't care either. <laughs> All righty then. What's going on next, Janine? Uh, so this is an update on the Cryptopia situation. Um, in episode 151, which is last year, we talked about the hack of Cryptopia, which is an exchange based in New Zealand, and that the hacker or inside exit scammer, I don't think they've confirmed whether they've discovered who it is, um, tried to move the funds to Binance, and oh look, Binance got hacked recently too. What a surprise. Then in episode 166, Rick gave us an update about, uh, I think that was about an hour and 18 minutes in, where they resumed trading, but users who held Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin faced a haircut. And since then, it appears that their business hasn't recovered because Grant Thornton, which is an assurance and tax advisory firm in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, the same area where Cryptopia is based, announced that they had been appointed as liquidators for the exchange business. And they say the highly publicized hack of Cryptopia's exchange in January, 2019 had a severe impact. Um, now wait, so wait, the Cryptopia thing, I'm confused. I thought the Cryptopia thing happened last year sometime or am I wrong? No, it did happen like late last year, I think like right before New Year's. Yeah, so I don't know why they say January 2019. I thought it was earlier than that. Oh, um, anyway, but it and actually been because we just came back from hiatus, it could have actually been right after New Year's, in fact. But it was right around that time. So they might be right. Instead. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so um, they say the highly publicized hack of Cryptopia's exchange had a severe impact on the company's trade, despite the efforts of management to reduce cost and return the business to profitability. It was decided that the appointment of liquidators was in the best interest of the customers, staff, and other stakeholders. The liquidators are focused on securing the assets for the benefit of all stakeholders. While this process and investigations take place, trading on the exchange is suspended. Um, and they also say at the end, they will be contacting all customers and suppliers about its appointment in the next few days. So I guess that is the fate of Cryptopia. Wrecked. <laughs> Super wrecked. Yeah, I remember covering that. And yeah, it was like the hair, the haircut was going to be bad, but uh, didn't know the exchange was going to completely go down. I, I knew that they were talking about liquidation. So boom, there it goes in the dust. Another one bites, another one bites, another one bites the dust. And YouTube, if you copy strike us for that, fuck you. Oh, that's coming, man. We're in trouble now. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to our final story. Some good, good shitcoin drama for you guys. All right, so big drama unfolding over there on the Tron Network. It's not really surprising when you have these highly centralized projects built on the backs of a few individuals who are likely to run into disagreements that you see them. So uh, this disagreement has the former CTO of Tron trying to burn the network to the ground as he bootstraps another project. Former CTO and co-founder of the Tron network, Lucian Chin, and Tron figurehead Justin Sun have been butting heads this past week about the circumstances surrounding his departure. Lucian says he left Tron because... Tron has lost its way, 
while Justin says he was fired earlier this year for embezzlement, bribery, and theft of intellectual property. Outside of Justin's allegations, there has been no evidence brought up to verify these claims. While Lucian put out a blog post on May 10th announcing his reasons for departure and plans for the future. The full blog post is in the show notes, but here are some highlights. Quote, Tron is no longer the original Tron. I chose to leave, hoping to regain my original mind and rebuild my new Tron. <laughs> the reason for leaving is very simple. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was kind of funny. Neutron, neutron. All right, so, sorry. The reason for leaving is very simple. As a technical man, I feel very sad that the Tron... <laughs> sorry, guys. Tron is ridiculous. They need a new name. All right. I feel very sad that the Tron has departed from the face of the decentralizing the web. Close quote. All right. He says Tron is no longer decentralized based off... Did you just do a whip crack? <laughs> No, I just dropped my notebook because this story has got me giggling like crazy because I'm <laughs> trying too many times in the notes. It sounded like a whip crack. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to crack the whip on these guys if they don't get their stuff in order. All right, let me get it in order. So he says Tron is no longer decentralized based off their delegated proof of stake and super representative node system which I think we all said that with their initial ICO looking very similar to EOS and its governance structure. Anyway, after all this money raised and going from testnet to mainnet, Tron has allegedly lost its way. Lucian goes on to say Tron is not associated with the internet. They've deviated from the spirit and original intent behind the blockchain. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is so funny. And that the project is now highly centralized. So, so he goes on to outline his... His new project, the Volume Network, which is truly decentralized blockchain project. He says in order to achieve this, the system will use, <laughs> I don't know what is going on here, guys. Proof of workload and proof of Megatron. consensus algorithms while using computer hard drives to mine on the network. He has an arbitrary ICO selling 3% of the tokens for $30,000, while the remaining 97% will only be issued through hard drive mining. While he thinks this setup is better than Tron is beyond me, but these are his plans for the future. While the plans for Justin's son and Tron's future remains uncertain, I'm sure they will continue to troll conferences with Justin's face and push out press releases saying new projects are gaining users. However, we know all projects like this are about to be left in the dust with the advent of things like Lightning and Liquid. But uh, I'm going to speculate that he left because the money is running out and he wants more of that sweet initial blockchain buzz money. So, uh, yeah, I'm, if you guys could keep along with all the laughing in that. But, I mean, like, I wrote this out and I, I knew it was comical, but it just really cracked me up reading it. Okay, so that shit coin is too centralized. So I'm going to go start a shit coin with proof of space instead. Buy my shit coin instead. <laughs> Just, Justin just wants to follow the path of uh, what's his face who created Ripple. Um, what's his name? Jed McCaleb. Jed McCaleb, yeah. Jed McCaleb did the same thing. He basically went part of Ripple. Then he's like, nope, I don't like you guys anymore. So I'm going to start Stellar, which is basically Ripple. So also, <laughs> Justin, where is the Tesla? You promised a Tesla as part of a giveaway, and then you gave them a bunch of Tron. Also, I would like to remind anybody attending Consensus right now that there is um, a bounty of somewhere around $800 pledged from multiple people, including myself, to pee on Justin's head. $800 for that <laughs> anywhere. Well, so wait, does it count? I saw a picture from... Uh, I think it was Crypto Scam Central account on Twitter that they put pictures of Justin on the urinals, but I think he just made that up. Does there, that count, there's though? Another, well, if, it, if there is video evidence of urination on either a picture of his face or his actual face, the bounty is claimable. You heard that, guys. A consensus. Just go throw a Justin Sun sticker in the urinals and take a video. 800 bucks. Paid for your ticket. All right. Yeah, that was a uh, really comical thing. But 
yeah, in all seriousness, I don't know what to think about what's going on over there as far as like thinking that this thing was decentralized and now he's going to go start this thing that is decentralized. Yeah, this is just where some of these people are, yeah, they're really just running with people's money and their hopes and dreams and all that. Yeah, let me just make it clear. If a project has a CEO or a president or chief something whatsoever, it's not decentralized. That's like a basic litmus test. So, so no. <laughs> uh, shitcoin is going to shitcoin. Bitcoin had a chief scientist. So it's <laughs> <decentralized>. <laughs> well, you're right about that. All right, so yeah, that looks like that about rounds it off for today. All righty. Well, uh, I guess I have your final thoughts set up first, Rick. So uh, let's get that going. All right, so yeah, my first final thought. It looks like the Jimmy song Joe Lubin bet is back on. I know that there was a bet a while back, and they didn't really quite work out the terms, but it seems like they did yesterday at Consensus, and it looks like, Jimmy Song's asking for 15 working dApps with 10,000 daily active users and over 100,000 monthly active users for a six-month period during any 12-month period up until May 23, 2023. And if Jimmy wins, then Joe has to pay him 69.74 Bitcoin. And if Joe wins, then Jimmy has to pay him 810.8 ETH, which, uh, yeah, it sounds like a crazy bet. But um, <laughs> yeah, so the bet's back on and that's the bet. So yeah, that's one of my final thoughts. I thought it was pretty interesting right before Arrows reading about it. And next up, second one. Yes, uh, this is from Stop and Decrypt. It looks like uh, the Bcash fee market is here. I don't know what happened, but it looks like some bug was just recently exposed this morning. <laughs> and now Bcash has got a fee market. And so... What's uh what's up, Roger? Why are you getting those fees up, man? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm I'm still not entirely sure of the details, but they hard forked. There was an issue with the block template generation, and then a bug with a signature flag. I think. And so they winded up uh, splitting, and then there was a bug causing empty blocks for like nine or ten blocks in a row or something like that. Wait, so you're telling me that when you add a bunch of opcodes that you haven't thoroughly tested for a long period of time, they have consequences? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, they need to hire Dead Elnix again. Alrighty, so no par, Janine. Guys, got any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I wanted to, for a very long time now, I wanted to do uh, blog digest testnet or blog digest highlights or 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 something like this. And Rick and Janine has been convinced for a while now, but. Uh, the latest news is that Shinobi has been convinced too. So I get the green light. <laughs> partially and convinced. Partial, he's partially convinced. <laughs> okay. I, I, I would be okay with setting up a sister channel that we just upload cuts to and we can link in like the other channel section of our page. I just, I, I am not okay with the idea of cluttering the whole videos page with like a million videos in between episodes and just making it a confusing mess to navigate through. Right. So from in the coming months, whenever I find the free time, I will set up a sister channel. Not sure what's going to call it. We'll figure out maybe blog digest test net or digest highlights <laughs> or something like that. And <laughs> And then I, I, I'm really curious what you guys think. Uh, would there be a demand for that? Uh, taking out uh, smaller clips uh, from the digest episodes and 
maybe people who are very busy would find more more value in 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 a more more condensed content so yeah that's the idea what do you guys think comment in the chat call, call it shits and gigabytes i i, I like black digest <laughs> test that i i like that one yeah or not, anyone can not do not me enough let's ask the audience let's say leave a comment below and tell us what should we call the highlights channel should we call it uh shits and gigabits was that what she said to me <laughs> shits and gigabytes or gigamegs and yes that is what i said gigamegs i feel like if we're block digest and then someone else is digesting what we digested that's basically shits so it's shits, <laughs> and, shits and gigabytes look digest digest yeah or uh, digest highlights or digest test net you guys and leave a comment below let us know what we should do Alrighty, and I guess I'm going to take us out uh, <clears throat> with a little audio clip. Uh, I was totally not paid to you do this. You didn't see her with Janine? Oh, no, wait, 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 did we? Yes, we did, I guess. Okay. Wait. Sorry, Janine. What? Final thought? Final thought for us? I, I, I don't have one except for go donate to Chelsea Manning's legal fund because apparently she still needs it because America's stupid. Oh, yeah. Do that. Alrighty then. I guess uh, keep your mics muted and we will see you guys next um, Wednesday. The best thing to do is simply to huddle. What's a young pony to do in a sea of shady ICOs? A lion's courage can light up even the darkness of shadows. Unlike the corporate suits, the whale panda is wise. A chicken dreams about the moon while soaring in the sky. As Bitcoin sees new all time highs. All around me, I see big block heads. crypto. The best thing to do is simply to huddle. When the airport strikes, turn the tide. You'll quickly rush to my side. Pods and fix until she's will clown. But I'm not scared to go around. We'll always run a full Bitcoin porno. Scaling the right way is a long and challenging road. Sanguine is now here for the US that we cheer. Layer 2 solutions are a must, always verify no trust. Magical crypto, all around me I see big block heads. Magical crypto, the best thing to do is simply to huddle. We'll always buy the dip, and we'll always be the best of the rest.